So today we had um, our annual meeting, and for all of you who are members, you were there. For all of you who are still sitting down, you couldn't be there, but next year you could when you are a member. So one thing that we talked about at our membership meeting was what does organic mean to you? Why are you part of this? Why are you part of NOFA New York? Is it an industry? Is it a movement? Is it a marketing tool? Is it a community? Why are you here? NOFA New York's everybody in this room. And so we'd like to continue building NOFA New York based on your input. So now I would like to welcome on um, Rowan White and Ken Green. And they're going to provide us with an opening for this amazing two and a half days. And, um, and then we're going to continue on with some scholarships, awards, and Farmers of the Year. So it's going to still a lot coming up. Sego, good evening. Um, before Ken begins, I would just like for us all to um, kind of settle into our chair and really put our hearts and our minds together uh, to be thinking about uh, the power of, of gathering here today on this particular piece of land that we're gathering on. And if we could just soften our minds a little bit to think about um, all the generations of people um, all the way back to the first nations of this land who've stewarded the land, who've made relationship to this land, who call this place home, right? And the many layers of history of settlers and immigrants and various people who've, who've come through here. But we would love to acknowledge, make a land acknowledgement of the original peoples of this land. Um, we know of this region as the Eastern door, right? And so the ancestral people of the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawk, the Ganyagihaga people, uh, as well as the Lenape and uh, many other tribal communities who gathered here long before uh, many of your ancestors came here. And so we just would love to uh, kind of kick off this conference knowing that there are many powerful speakers coming who will be carrying in uh, voices of their own traditions, but to acknowledge uh, the people who uh, call this place home from since time immemorial. So thank you all for carrying that spirit of all the ancestors of this land into this room. So many of us have come here to share stories, um, definitely to complain about the weather. It was a really rough season. Um, break bread together and be inspired. But cultivating community at a conference or outside the conference is a responsibility. And it's a responsibility that requires us to think about who is here and who isn't here, who feels like they belong and who feels like they don't belong. This year we're holding the second biennial uh, Northeast Seed Growers Conference at the NOFA New York Conference and inviting the seed keepers and the seed breeders and seed producers who provide the living foundation of the organic seed movement to be part of this conference. And it's a really important and welcoming gesture from the farmer community that lets us know that you value our work and that we all belong together. One of the conversations that we'll be having this weekend involves the question, what is a seed? And how we answer that question together can change the landscape of our food and seed systems. Whether we're learning about the science of seeds, classical seed breeding, the culture of seeds, the ethics of seeds, what's happening with gene editing, uh, seed justice, we're exploring an idea of belonging. Do seeds, or for that matter the, so matter, the soil that we farm, belong to any of us? And so right now you have a seed in your hand, and I'd like you to take that seed and close your eyes and spend a little bit of time just feeling that seed, the texture, the shape of it. See if you can get to know the seed just between your fingers. And then you can open your eyes and take a closer look at that seed. What can you tell about that seed from its color or its shape that you can see visually? What do you think you know about that seed? So much of what we can know is really just a very tactile experience at this point. We don't really know, or we may not know, if it's open pollinated or 
hybrid or genetically engineered. We may not know exactly what variety it's going to grow. But one thing that we should know about it um, is that this seed was passed into our hands through many other hands. How did this seed wind up between your fingers? How many generations, how many thousands of years before it wound up in your hand has it gone through? And from there, now that you've touched it and your fingerprints are on it, and you're part of that seed coat, what are you doing to be part of that story? And what does that mean to you? And so I'd like you to take that seed that you just got to know, and I'd like you to turn to someone next to you and give them your seed and go ahead and do that. So was that tough? <coughs> I find that some people get very attached to their seed. <laughs> you got to know that seed. You started to care about that seed, right? But again, that sense of belonging, there's times when belonging is really important, when we have to belong to each other, and we need to rely on each other. And that type of belonging is very important. And then there's times when belonging is actually a liability, when we start to say, this thing is mine and I control it in some way, or um, I'm not going to share it. And so sometimes we have to let go of that sense of belonging and that idea of belonging to realize, especially with seeds, that they don't belong to us. And so part of some of the newer work that I've been doing and a lot of what Rowan has been doing is really thinking about this community of farmers, of growers, of seed breeders, of seed savers and seed keepers and how we belong together. And at the same time, how do we honor the origins of those seeds, where those seeds came from, how they passed into our hands, and how, and how do we honor that by instead of saying, this belongs to me, we really think about where those seeds should be going and what hands should be receiving those seeds. So I'm gonna yeah. turn that over to you. Uh, it was told to me by uh, wise elders from our community that uh, the seeds don't belong to us, but they, um, they belong to our children, right? So I think you could insert soil or land or many other things uh, in that same understanding that part of our responsibility as uh, farmers and chefs and educators and you know, all of the various uh, skills and gifts that you carry is thinking about how your work can be impactful by acknowledging that one day you'll be a good future, you're a good ancestor, right? That you're a future ancestor here. And, but you're also have, you also are responsible descendants, right? And part of that is acknowledging your uh, existence on that continuum of time, right? Of stewardship and relationship to land and to seed and to food. As we as indigenous peoples contemplate that and really look to the ways in which uh, we can heal ourselves and heal those relationships to the land and to seed and to food. We oftentimes have to make really unconventional or maybe historically very different partners and, co and collaborations with people who may have been historically adversaries, right? People who we had a hard time seeing eye to eye. Um, people who we may have seen historically as, as enemies, right? But now, in this time, as we seek to find ways to nourish and feed our communities who are in desperate need of uh, good nourishing food that's culturally appropriate, we have to really look um, not only at the wisdom that's held within our communities with, with our elders and our um, aunties and uncles and our young people, um, but we're also being invited, I think, by the seeds themselves to, to call in uh, and sit under, as the Mohawk people say, the, the tree of peace, right? Um, and sometimes that tree of peace is a garden, right? And the way in which we uh, can grow good food together. I come here representing the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network, which is a collection of uh, seed keepers from all over Turtle Island. Uh, we come together with good heart and good mind to um, uphold the responsibilities that have been passed down to us by countless generations of people who prayed that 
you know, that we here standing here today would have good food to eat. We've been asked by not only the seeds themselves, but I think uh, our ancestors and, and wise ones, forces seen and unseen, um, to find interesting kinship routes that will help um, seeds find their way home to us. As indigenous peoples of this land, we have a diverse and beautiful collection of seeds uh, stewarded by foresighted elders who kept those seeds alive amidst so much challenges and adversities. Um, one of my seed elders is here in the room, uh, Steve McCumber. Um, many of you, I hope, will get the chance to meet him. Um, but he kept some very important seeds of our community alive for during times when not a lot of people were growing our foods and keeping those stories and those traditions alive, right? And, and became involved in getting some of those seeds um, moving out of our communities and into the hands of farmers, just like you all who are sitting here in this room. And some of those seeds, um, seeds move just like people do, right? And they move along trade routes and kinship routes to many unconventional places, right? People who settled in this land who found that a certain type of white flint corn made really good um, Johnny cakes and, and kept uh, people fed in places like Rhode Island and Connecticut outside of uh, indigenous communities. And those seeds moved uh, around and sometimes found them, themselves into seed banks, places like Seed Savers Exchange or the USDA uh, Grin um, system or universities or sometimes even museums, some of these seeds had landed. And during the decades, um, sometimes centuries, of um, assimilation and the legacies of colonization, sometimes those seeds lost touch with their communities of origin, right? That they were no longer being grown uh, in those indigenous communities. And as the movement for food sovereignty and seed sovereignty has been growing in uh, indigenous communities, we've had to begin to think about ways in which we could find those seeds of our ancestors and begin to grow them again. Indigenous Seed Keepers Network has partnered with uh, several institutions, um, Seed Savers Exchange being one of them, which is one of the largest public access seed banks in the country with over 30,000 varieties um, of all kinds of, of foods uh, being held there as well as uh, institutions like the Minnesota Museum of Science and University of Michigan and uh, the Field Museum in Chicago. Uh, finding seeds that had been gifted to somebody like Oscar Will, who in uh, the late 1800s was trading seeds with uh, the Mandan and the Arikara people, and that influenced you know, some of the covers of his seed catalogs in the late 1800s, and those seeds, um, as that seed company folded, made their way into institutions like the Minnesota Museum of Science and places like Seed Savers. And so we stepped outside of our comfort zone a little bit and decided to extend an invitation for partnership with organizations like those to see how we could engage in this work that we're calling seed rematriation, which is, um, many of you might be familiar with the word repatriation, which is the returning of ancestral remains and funerary objects and sacred objects to communities of origin. Um, we put a spin on the word because we feel like as we bring seeds home, uh, in our cosmologies we see them as living relatives that are coming home after a long time away uh, to, to continue to uphold their original agreements um, to feed and nourish us and that we're bound in this reciprocal relationship to care for them. So we've been making really beautiful and sometimes uncon unconventional partnerships and this year, we initiated the first uh, official seed rematriation partnership with Seed Savers Exchange. And um, out of their catalog or their collection, uh, we identified thousands of varieties that have indigenous origin. And we began um, the task of uh, starting small with 25 varieties that had uh, cultural significance. And Seed Savers grew them on their farm in Iowa. And then we bundled them up uh, this fall and we're doing the work now of beginning to return those seeds home back to those communities of origin. And we just had a seed rematriation in Taos Pueblo in New Mexico where a squash that had been lost by the people there uh, returned home and it was incredibly powerful and emotional and, um, and really 
uh, is part of the healing and rec reconciliation that's so needed in these times, right? Um, and so tonight, um, kind of as part of a larger uh, seed rematriation, uh, we've invited a few community members from the um, Ganyagehaga people from a couple of different communities from Gotnawage and also Okwesasne uh, to join us here tonight. And um, we wanted to extend uh, our um, acknowledgement for the work that they're doing in their communities to keep these seeds alive and to also be willing to trust and make beautiful, uh, inclusive partnerships with, with other um, with other people outside their communities. And so I would like to um, call to the stage uh, Steve McCumber, who's uh, uh, from Gatnawage, if you'd like to come up, and then Galaguino from Akwasasne, and Lunat Miahawe from Akwasasne as well. And they really represent all the generations that are needed to keep these seeds alive in our community. We have the elders who have that foresight and have the wisdom, and we have the aunties and the uncles who, um, are standing on that doorway to memory and are receiving uh, the teachings from the elders. And then we have the young people who have the strength of heart and the hands and the strong backs that can uh, do this work uh, in the garden. And it really takes, this is intergenerational work. Right here is a representation of this intergenerational work. And as one small offering that will be a series of uh, homecomings uh, across uh, the Six Nations here in New York and Southern Canada. We wanted to take this opportunity to offer a couple bundles of seed um, from Seed Savers. I was just there uh, last week um, and they bundled these seeds up with care um, knowing that they were going to be coming back home to this community. And so I would love um, for you all, invite you all to bear witness to um, this, uh, this gift giving, um, which is uh, very important for us as, uh, as Indigenous peoples to just really acknowledge uh, those people who um, have given us so much. And I've spent 20 years as, uh, seeing myself as a seed keeper, and I would be nothing um, standing here without uh, the generosity of this man right here. So I just want to acknowledge Steve McCumber for all the work you've been doing on behalf of our communities. And uh, these beans are the Mohawk pole uh, beans um, that Steve McCumber likely traded out into the world a long time ago, and then they've been, uh, com they've, they're coming back home to Gatnawage, so I'd love to um, offer you this gift. And to Galaguino and Aunt Weahawe, I would love to offer also a, a package of these Six Nations uh, Iroquois beans so that they can bring them home to the Ohologo uh, uh, group to plant in their garden, which is our rites of passage um, to keep alive in, in their gardens and to share them with other community members. So I'd like for you both to come up. And in that spirit, we, we invite um, you all to come to uh, our sessions tomorrow. Uh, we have a lot of uh, fruitful conversations ahead of us, um, exploring seeds of resilience and reconciliation and um, ways in which we can all work together. Uh, we all descend from a long, long lineage of ancestors who did so many things to keep these seeds alive, the seeds alive that feed you, that get planted on your farm and garden. That's a result of the legacy of countless generations of seed keepers and farmers from not only the First Nations people of this land, but also your ancestors. We're only oftentimes a generation or two removed from um, having a heartfelt connection to those uh, seeds and to that lineage and to those stories. And so we invite you as part of this conference that this might be an embodiment of a prayer that we might make renewed commitment to explore the ways in which we can continue to deepen our relationship to seed, continue to uh, have the courage in our hearts to um, sit down with people who might not look like you or who might, not, who might believe things that are different from you and have the difficult conversations that need to happen in this day and age so that we can move to a time where we can really see uh, the birthing of the food system and um, the ways of nourishment that we all know are possible. You guys are all dreamers and you're doers and you're amazing, creative 
uh, humans, we have the potential to take this movement to the next level as we continue to cultivate change and inclusivity and uh, work together cross-culturally to uh, uh, birth this new way of feeding each other. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ken and Rowan. That was so beautiful. Thank you. Um, we had some really wonderful scholarships this year. We were able to have 10 full scholarships, which meant registration, uh, lodging, and a travel stipend. Um, but we were able to have a total of 20 scholarships, um, which covered registration and allowed a lot of really great people to attend. And then we also do have one special scholarship that um, Scott Chasky gives every year, and I'm gonna allow him to tell us about it. Uh, well, I'd like to thank um, NOFA New York for continuing to give this scholarship uh, every year. Um, it's been going on for uh, eight years now, and um, it's a really beautiful tradition. And, uh, you know, the, the people that have changed at NOFA, well, many of you have been here with us a long, a long time, uh, but it's really wonderful that, to continue to, to honor honor Josh, um, and um, each year, um, what a job it is to pick the person to receive this scholarship, an amazing uh, group of people who, uh, who we look through every year. So in the honor of uh, the uh, s seeds that uh, we just heard about, and um, in one of the very moving sessions I was at um, not long ago, um, someone spoke of the web of relationships, and so um, I'm going to read uh, just a little paragraph uh, before giving this award to Maggie from a book that I wrote called Seed Time. Uh, and uh, the paragraph is about our need to commit a, a definition of progress that includes the natural world as well as the human world. The author Ronald Wright uses the term progress trap to describe a short-term social or technological improvement that turns out in the long run to be a backward step. Once the mistake is realized, it is too late to change course. In the modern industrial era, our human species seems to be more than capable of taking many backward steps. But there is another way to proceed through a recognition of the web of relationships of which we are a part. In the myth of progress, my friend Tom Wessels offers the example of mycorrhizal fungi or fungus roots that help plant life absorb nutrients in a certain forest system, in many forest systems. The fungi actually spread out within the soil to feed energy to struggling paper birch trees when they are surrounded by more robust Douglas fir trees. He calls them tree shepherds. He adds that our task as individuals is to progress in a manner in which our attention, our compassion, and our empathy grow ever outward to benefit our communities and society as a whole. Josh was uh, one of those tree shepherds. Maggie is here, we hope. Maggie is here. <laughs> okay, so we're awarding this scholarship to Maggie, uh, who is one of the next tree shepherds. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Congratulations, Maggie. Um, so our last of the awards that we will be presenting today is our Golden Carrot Awards, our, our Golden Carrot Awards. So the Golden Carrot Award is given to board members, um, retiring staff, amazing members that really stand out. Um, and I really love this quote by uh, Paul Cezanne. The day is coming when a single carrot, freshly observed, will set off a revolution. And that's what our golden carrot um, 
recipients really are. And so I would like to present the first Golden Carrot Award to our outgoing board president, Phil Barbado. Where are you, Phil? Where are you? There you are. Um, so Phil um, hired me, so it's his fault, along with the rest of this hiring committee. Um, and Phil has really been an incredibly steady hand for me. He has, he speaks from his heart. He is always looking out for the way for everybody to get along in the most peaceful, intentional ways. Um, and he moves, he's been moving me forward in the last two and a half years through some pretty, <laughs> pretty uh, challenging times really with a calm voice and a very peaceful, I just think of peaceful when I think of Phil, with like a peaceful vision. Um, and he's able to bring a rather challenging situation down to a place where we can see the situation, we can address the situation, we can move through the situation. And I have so appreciated Phil's um, position as the board president, and I'm going to miss him, but he will not be leaving Nofa, New York. Um, and I know that Phil also would like to say a few words. And here is your golden carrot. I didn't know this was coming. But uh, I had previously asked Andriana if I could have five minutes of tonight just to speak to you all. So I wrote you a letter. This is a letter to my fellow travelers on this journey towards a better world. The sphere of life on Earth is huge, and we are only a small part of it. It spans a broad spectrum from micro to macro in size. The life forms are complexly interrelated through the evolution of millions of years. We all know this, and we are gathered here today because we share this understanding of life, we care deeply about the other forms of life, we know how humans play such a large role, and we understand how important the rest of life is to our own existence and happiness. Let us continue on our journey, discovering, learning from, caring for, and sharing with the other forms of life. For we are only a part of it and depend on it for our very survival. All of us here understand that without an absorption of the organic lifestyle and environmental ethic into the fabric of our society, we will lose the natural world as we now know it. But not all of our fellow humans believe this. As we continue on this journey, it's critical that we help others to join us for the benefit of all life and our own future. We need to help them to understand. We must challenge the old beliefs that growth must go on forever that our environment and our economy are not connected, that we can always count on a quick fix from our technology or our government programs. That kind of thinking is what has led us directly to the place we are in now, facing irreversible climate change, famine, civil unrest, and a breakdown of societies. But there is a solution and our organic community is already an integral part of it. We must continue and lead the way to help our fellow citizens to understand that we must steward the Earth's resources as if they were borrowed from future generations, that the Earth has a limited carrying capacity, that without a healthy environment, we can have no healthy economy, that economic growth based on using up non Renewable resources and generating waste is a false short-term economy. And that the earth must be shared with the other living things on it. 
Are we perfect? Do we know everything? No. But we will keep on searching, looking, communicating, and learning to be better members of the Earth's wonderful ecosystem. We all share a strong desire to protect and preserve the natural world and to enhance the health and welfare of the humans who depend on it. Let's keep working on it together. I am in awe of the talent, diversity, dedication, knowledge, humanity, and strength of all our members and our staff. I want to thank you all for allowing me this incredible honor of serving on your board of directors. It's been a highlight and a high point in my life. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Phil. Um, so we have one more award, one more carrot, golden carrot award um, that Mary Howell will be presenting. It's, it's going to be in absentia. So. Okay. I'm just going to say. And, and this is a gorgeous picture. Um, shoot, shoot, shoot. It's amazing what Google Images can do. Um, we don't actually give them a golden carrot like this, but it is, it is still beautiful. Um, this, too, is a letter. And unfortunately, the person who's receiving the second golden carrot can't be here today. And it will be, you'll understand when I get through it. I don't usually read presentations because I think um, I don't really like doing it. But I don't want to miss anything here. Um, and so I'm going to read this um, and bear with me. Um, many of you are new to NOFA New York, but some of us old folks have been coming here to these conferences for over 30 years. We can remember sleeping overnight on the floor at TC3, the community college down in, Tom in Portland. <laughs> Chasing our very small children who aren't small children at all any, uh, uh, anymore around. Then the group swelling to overfilling the Holiday Inn in Liverpool, and then moving here to Saratoga about 10 years ago. For, few, for a few of us, much, much of our, our adult history has been connected with NOFA New York. Throughout those years, there has been one person who has seemed to be everywhere, making things work and work well, making sure everybody had what they needed, making sure everybody was welcomed, recognized, appreciated, and hugged. We all saw her once a year at NOFA New York Conference, but many did not see her doing exactly the same thing 365 days a year. This year, I have the remarkable honor of presenting the Golden Carrot Award to someone who's been a friend for a long time. Her name is Lisa, Lisa Engelbert, and unfortunately, you know, I wish, I wish she could be standing up here, but you probably recognize her. Um, this is the NOFA New York's highest award for service above and beyond to our members, to organics, and to the New York organic community. Phil just gave a wonderful talk about the philosophy behind organics, but unfortunately, many of us know that there's a business behind organics. And keeping integrity in organics is very, very important, and that's something that Lisa has done. We first met Lisa and Kevin Engelbert in the early 1990s when we were first transitioning to organics on our farm. We were surprised to learn that they had been farming organically for nearly 10 years, long before uniform organic standards, even before there was an organic market for their milk. They first received their organic certification in 1984, which is, of course, before many of you were born. Um, they generously shared their experience with us their pioneering weed control and their management of cows without antibiotics. They've been a tremendous source of education and inspiration for us and for many others in the organic community. In the mid-1990s, 
the first New York organic dairy farmers decided to pool their milk together and make a recognizable brand of cheese, forming the Butternut Co-op. To manage their accounts, their sales, their marketing, the co-op hired Lisa, and quickly the immensity of this idealistic project, the complicatedness of it, and the challengingness of it, quickly fell into her lap. From working with the contract companies to make the cheese, storing the product often in her own refrigerator, getting it to stores, paying accounts, there was so much to do, that, to make this, to, to do. And if this project had been successful, it would have been rewarding. But unfortunately, not all of our, up, our uphill battles are worth it. For all the hard work, the Butternut Co-op was not a success. Once again, we are impressed by Lisa Engelbert, handling Butternut's decline with grace, with a smile, with a laugh, a hug, ready to look forward to the next challenge. This is a picture of Lisa and Kevin and their three, three sons. And lucky for us, she was ready for another challenge because the next challenge was NOFA New York. We were at the beginning of the brave new world of the National Organic Program, desperately in need of a certification director who was knowledgeable, practical, logical, and realistic, who deeply understood organic standards from both, as both the letter and also the intent of the standard, who could speak to the farmers with empathy, experience, understanding, and firmness, and also could speak to the USDA regulators as a professional and with maturity. Few of us organic farmers in the room today remember the chaotic and high stakes time the early 2000s were in organic certification as the National Organic Program came in, as all the different agencies were forced to adopt uniform standards, not necessarily willingly, as longtime organic farmers resented governmental interference and new organic farmers couldn't understand why we had to do it that way, when nearly any conversation about organic requirements ended up with arguments. Through that storm, Lisa was a quiet, quiet but towering force of reason and experience in New York, crafting the new NOFA New York to be professional, effective, and reasonably able to handle the staggering growth. When Lisa explained the requirements, we knew she understood the implications, the difficulties, our insecurities. We knew that her insistence on integrity was because she knew that things could be done, and therefore there was no excuse not to do it. When it came time to craft grass-fed standards in dairy, Lisa again led the way because she understood how to do it. In 2006, tragedy struck on the Engelbert farm. One night, the Susquehanna River, swollen from excessive rain, started rising in its banks. Water rapidly uh, swamped the Engelbert dairy farm, carrying away hay bales like great big marshmallows in the water. The newly planted fields were underwater, and the family was rescuing calves in boats. The extent of the flood damage was devastating and discouraging. I went down there uh, to their farm in 2006 to help um, clean up some of the mess scrubbing the stinky, slimy flood mud. And if, if you ever cleaned up after a flood, there's nothing like flood mud, um, off the milk house walls, because it was up that high in the milk house. But as always, Lisa handled the mess with, a, with grace, with a smile, a hug, ready for the next challenge. The afternoon we spent scrubbing that stuff off the walls was not filled with discouragement and despair, but we spent most of the time laughing. That was not the only devastating flood the Engelbert farm uh, uh, in, endured. In September 11th, when the hurricanes came through, again, they were swamped. This time, it washed out roads, it destroyed all their hay supplies that they'd already made up for the year, but again, they recovered and they rebuilt. About that time, Lisa, with Kevin, their sons, and their newly added daughters-in-law, started working on ways to diversify the farm, to enhance farm income by adding value and adding products. A small store was built, some of their milk was made into artisan cheese, the garden was expanded to provide vegetables for sale, animals were butchered into consumer-ready packages of steaks, roasts, and hamburger. Soon local stores, restaurants, wineries, and buying clubs were selling their products and asking for more, and it was very difficult to keep up with supplies. And this is some pictures off their Facebook page of all different places that they've gone selling their products. 
But even with this growing market, throughout this time, Lisa worked part-time at NOFA New York, consistently providing the voice of good sense, integrity, continuity, reason, the voice of a real farmer with experience and empathy. Lisa has guided NOFA New York through some pretty rough waters, through staff changes, through a rapidly changing organic market, through inconsistency of USDA requirements and oversight, through allegations of fraud, from being a seat of the pants gee whiz office to being a professional, responsible professional agency that is respected throughout the country. When she started at NOFA New York, there were 54 certified organic dairy farms and they were one of them. Now there are 445 NOFA New York certified dairy farms, over 780 certified organic dairy farms in New York. Lisa has mentored and trained numerous NOFA New York staff members, one of whom recently told me, Lisa has always been the go-to spokesperson for NOFA New York certification and organic integrity, just an all-round, good-hearted, positive person. While another staff member told me, Lisa has been the grounding energy at NOFA New York, bringing a mindset of the highest integrity to all decision-making. A coworker said, her knowledge of organic standards and how it applies to each farm is amazing. Because she is a farmer herself, she has stood squarely with one foot in the farmer's world and one foot in the certifier's world, understanding the challenges of both, and she was usually the one who could see solutions to problems. Another coworker said, somebody should acknowledge Lisa's delicious dessert classic, truffles made from her mouvash cheese. Lisa is an amazing cook. I will miss working with her and her smile, but I will miss her food. So <laughs> we all have uh, things that we are remembered for. So without a doubt, Lisa has done it all with grace, with a smile, a laugh, a hug, ready to look forward to the next challenge. The next challenge of, for the Engelbert family is a pretty remarkable and pretty immense one right now. In the little town of Nichols, there is an old building that used to be a creamery, a board and creamery. Over the years, it has been repurposed as a restaurant, an event center, but most recently is just set in, vacant and locked. This past year, the Engelbert family purchased the building and has extensively refurbished it into a commercial kitchen and a retail space. This will allow them to process more of their farm products, improve their refrigerated and frozen storage, improve their retail space, and turn their marketing into a tangible, real commercial enterprise. But unfortunately for NOFA New York, Lisa has design, decided to resign, knowing that her time and her effort is more importantly spent on this new, uh, process, this new enterprise. From her experience of being a nearly 35-year organic dairy farmer, now tell me, show of hands, how many of you are under 35? She's been at it for 35 years as an organic dairy farmer. Lisa Engelbert and her family have been, tr been tr creating a truly organic life, one that enhances the viability and resilience of their farm, one that is allowing a growing family of adult children and grandchildren to work together toward common goals, one that has given visibility to a model of organic dairy farming in New York that is of the highest integrity and that is firmly grounded in the model of healthy pastures, healthy cows, healthy people, healthy communities, healthy food. And all clearly visible from one of the most heavily traveled interstates in upstate New York, and that's I-86, because it's real close to Binghamton. From all of us at NOFA New York, we are deeply grateful for the work that Lisa Engelbert has put into NOFA, for her time and her expertise, for her many years of professional management and representation, for her unwavering commitment to the highest level of organic integrity, and of course, for her grace, her smiles, her laughs, and her hugs. So, we feel that nobody has deserved these two awards more than Lisa and for Phil. There are some amazing leaders in NOFA, and they do a whole lot that is not visible. And you know, it's, it's pretty neat to have the opportunity to give a friend an award like this. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Howell. And we will get Lisa her golden carrot. Um, so 
our last award of the evening of the conference is um, our Farmers of the Year. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris Browder, our board treasurer, to introduce our Farmers of the Year. Thanks, Andriana. Hello, everyone. Um, I got to put my glasses on so I can actually see my notes here. Um, my name is Chris Browder, and I am, like many of you, a proud uh, NOFA New York certified organic farmer. And in our case, we raise pastured poultry on the east end of Long Island, which we've been doing well, Strong Island. And we've been doing that for the last 10 years. Um, and since our farm is just a few minutes away from saying Lee's, over the past 10 years, I've watched with great admiration and respect the tail end of a total transformation of Sangley Farms, the result of which is a thriving, high quality, high integrity, certified organic vegetable farm that the East End of Long Island has embraced with a passion. Sang Lee began operations at the end of World War II and over several decades became an 1,100-acre sprawling farm growing conventional Asian specialty vegetables for the wholesale market throughout the East Coast of the United States. Today, Sang Lee is a 100-acre direct-to-retail certified organic vegetable farm selling over 100 varieties of vegetables at farmers' markets through their CSA and farm stand, and most recently through their commercial kitchen. This transformation was taken not as a matter of convenience, but as a matter of farm survival. With the advent of cheap imports and the high cost of farming on Long Island, in the early 2000s, Fred and Karen realized the commodity wholesale market, even for Asian specialty vegetables, could no longer sustain their farm. So they made the gut-wrenching decision to abandon the wholesale uh, business model that they had been following and fully embrace the direct-to-retail model that they employ today. In my opinion, this transformation has been an amazing success. As I watch Sangley operate, and I do go to many of the same farmers markets that they do, there are three things that stand out to me. First, they're outstanding growers. The, pro the quality of produce that they grow is amazing. Second, uh, they're really wonderful branding and merchandising folks. Um, if you go to a, if you go to a uh, Sangley Farmer's Market booth, you won't find a wilted piece of lettuce anywhere. Uh, the beet greens are all perfect. I mean, it is unbelievable the attention to de detail that they, uh, that they attend to. And then finally, they're able to attract and retain uh, incredible talent. And I'm somewhat jealous of this, uh, working right down the road. Uh, but they have an ability to engender loyalty in their, in their employees, oftentimes young and enthusiastic, year after year after year, um, which is really a reflection of who they are as people. You see, Fred and Karen are two of the nicest and most humble people you will ever meet. And that goes for their family, Will and Lucy are here today, and many of their employees as well. So in recognition of the incredible and successful transformation of Sangley Farms that is now nearly complete, and for the strong commitment to organic and sustainable farming practice, and for the difference Sang Lee has made in the East End Long Island farming community, NOFA New York is very proud to award the 2019 Farmers of the Year Award to Fred and Karen Lee, Will Lee, and Lucy Sinisek. So if you guys would please come up. Let's give a big round of applause.
Um, I have a few. Sorry. Um, all right, we'll use the buttons. Yeah, I'll use things. the buttons, yeah. Yeah. You can see we're well-practiced at this, too. Uh, thank you, Chris, um, for that great introduction. Uh, I really am deeply honored to be here tonight to humbly accept this Farmer of the Year Award on behalf of my family, all the great staff of Sangley Farms, because they are really the folks that have made this award and this achievement possible. All of us have worked very hard over the last 74 plus years, moving equipment, family between Florida and New York, alongside many of our staff and farmhands. It's always been the staff that we have been blessed with over the course of many seasons which have truly made this event happen. There are a great number of people that I want to thank, and I'm not going to list them all. <laughs> but of course, my parents, George and Eunice, my uncles, John and Hugh, my cousins, Richard and Tom, and staff members that just among three of them have put in 118 seasons with us. Uh, Herman Chamali, Yang Gao, Fong Shu, Ann Van Nguyen, Lucy, my son Will, and most importantly, uh, my wife and primary business partner, Karen. She has been and continues to be one of the strongest factors in keeping us relevant and moving forward in our continuing farm story. Accordingly, for this evening, I would like to accept this award on behalf of all the great family of staff that we have made, or that have made Sangley what we are today. I'm most honored to accept this award, not as individual farmers, but as a family of farmers for the 2019 NOFA New York Farm of the Year. Thank you. I have a few slides to share with you on how we got to this point, a little bit of our history, and then each one of us are gonna speak and share a little bit about what we're doing and how we do it. Um, they'll say a few words about each of their areas and then I'll come back and, and do a closing. But out of curiosity before when we're showing the hands, how many people are involved with dairy production? Okay. And those in vegetable production? Okay. Um, out of those people in dairy or vegetable, how many have been farming at least five years? Okay. Keep your hands up. Okay. Hold them up and keep them up. If you farm at least 10 years, okay, 20, 30, and 40. How about any with multi-generational issues? Very good. Thank you. I honor and respect all farmers, no matter how long or short you've been farming, conventional or organic, you've been at this life's occupation. I ask this question for you to understand where and how our family farm got started. Um, if you look at that map of Long Island, we actually started about midway in the island and moved twice before we got to the North Fork. My Uncle John first got involved with farming about 1944, and after World War II, page down, no, to the right. Okay. Uh, my dad came back from the Navy, and he joined my Uncle John farming Chinese vegetables in the Huntington, Melville area of Long Island. All three of my dad's brothers swore they would never continue doing the Chinese laundry that my grandfather had started at the t just after the turn of the century. In the early 1900s and a little bit later, there were not a whole lot of job opportunities for American-born Chinese. And farming Chinese vegetables for the growing populations in Washington, D.C., New York City, Boston, Philadelphia was a business opportunity that they recognized and capitalized on. As a conventional truck farm, we shipped Chinese vegetables as far west as Chicago, north into Toronto, Montreal, Canada, and as far south as Miami during the course of the year and during our peak years. 
Um, this is a shot in Melville, uh, my mom and dad. That was probably in the late 40s, early 50s. Um, that's a shot when we moved to East Murchis on the south side of Long Island in 1964. Um, this is a shot of three of the crops. I think we had a total of 12 vegetable crops that we farmed. Um, Napa, bok choy, that's a lobok or a daikon. We had gailan, Chinese broccoli, and yu choy. Um, this next shot is a shot actually of broccoli as we were transitioning out of Chinese cabbage, but um, the next shot here, just so you get an idea, um, that's approximately 70 acres within the field of view, and there's a lateral irrigation system in the distance. Um, we farmed a lot of Chinese cabbage. <laughs> so, um, these were some of the trucks coming out of the field that had uh, lobok or Chinese radishes. We loaded tractor trailers to get into the terminal markets in New York City, Chinatown area. Um, if you look in the background of those uh, wax cartons, you'll see the top of a vacuum tube. Um, I don't know if anyone is vacuum cooling right now, but it's something that is a quick cooling process and we use to prepare the vegetables for shipment long distance out of state. Um, that's one of our more recent trucks, although it's pretty old there. <laughs> um, that's my dad actually standing in a field of bok choy. Um, that was our single largest crop that we had. Contrary to what many of you may be thinking, I did not grow up planning on becoming a farmer. Even though I worked I can't believe I'm here, too. <laughs> Even though I worked almost every summer on the farm, I really hoped by going off to college that I would find an alternative to the hard work that I had to do almost every year of my life. After graduating from the University of Vermont, I spent two additional full-time years um, on both the New York and Florida farms. It sort of convinced me that I wasn't going to farm. I went back to Boston University to get my MBA and to explore other options. But during that last semester, my dad was diagnosed with kidney cancer and passed away in the last semester of my schooling, 1980. Um, I came back that December to help the other family members on the farm and my mom sort through the cha changes. For the more, most part, I just had my head down and became consumed with the work the change of seasons, and the challenges that came up every year. Over the course of the farm's first 40 years, we experienced a lot of growth and expansion. And as Chris mentioned, at our peak, we were well over 1,100 acres of production during the 12-month operating cycle between Florida and New York. As the Asian vegetable market increased in size and became more mainstream, supplies started coming in from south of the border, Mexico, and back down from Canada. The markets became extremely competitive, and we found it increasingly difficult with each passing season. It no longer mattered if I could speak Cantonese to the customers or the wholesalers. Everyone understood dollars and cents better than Chinese, and we experienced a lot of change, both at the retirement of some of my uncles and the passing of additional family members. Around 1985 or 86, both farms were sold in Florida and New York, 320 acres in Hope Sound, Florida, and 220 acres in East Murchis, New York. So the landscape and our markets were all changing very dramatically. Um, that was a, a shot just after my father passed away. My two cousins are standing up in the back, and my other uncles, not all my father's brothers, are seated but that was the management group we had then. And so in 1987, I discontinued the winter production altogether. And with one cousin, my partner Richard, we moved the farm operations to our current location in Peconic on the North Fork of Long Island for just six months out of the year. We initially rented about 300 acres of farmland to continue doing the wholesale business, but with each passing year, 
we were cropping less and less, trying to change our product line and our markets. Instead of selling exclusively to the Asian markets in the Chinatown areas, we started going to the terminal markets in the metropolitan areas along the East Coast. Then in 1993, my cousin, an only remaining business partner at the time, went through a divorce. And that precipitated a split with myself and the farm. I farmed by myself until about 2001, when we experienced a major market disruption with the World Trade Building jet crashes in New York City. Um, for those that you remember, they closed the bridges to all commercial traffic for three days, I believe, if not more. The New York City Chinatown market, which was our primary market, suffered tremendously. A few years later, in 2004, I lost the lease to my main farm parcel of 142 acres, which is directly across the street from where that photo shows. And I was forced to have an equipment auction. It was, in my mind, the beginning of the end. And the, even though I kept back some tractors and a few pieces of equipment, I sold the majority of the farm equipment, and I dropped down to about 50 acres of rented farmland by 2005. I felt like a failure, and I wasn't sure how to keep the farm going. During that time period, of great turmoil, Karen and the kids started selling flowers on the roadside in the late 1990s. With the kids spending more time running through the fields, I began spraying less or not all of the fields, especially the ones adjacent to the flowers where they were cutting. As a primary pesticide applicator, I just didn't want to handle the chemicals anymore. Over a number of years, I continued using less and less of the chemical amendments and made a transition to farming organically because I felt it was better for the kids, their exposure, the plants, and the vegetables that we were eating. A lot of people told me that was such a great marketing move. You know, you're a genius. <laughs> Perfect timing for consumer preferences. But in reality, it was just motivated by a personal choice to grow organically. We became certified organic in 2007. This was a shot of uh, Will, Mike, and Jen, um, the year that we became certified organic. Karen continued expanding the retail sales by offering some of the Chinese and mixed baby vegetables that we grew. The roadside table that we started initially on the road in front of the farm moved a little bit close to the farmhouse and then ended up taking over the garage at the farmhouse. I had a fit because the garage was where the crew had their lunch and breaks. And she told me she needed just a little bit more room to sell the, the vegetables. But then she stayed in there because it was raining outside, it got too cold, and the rest was history. I said it before, and I'm going to say it again now, that Karen, if she had not helped me change and started the retail farm stand, Sangley Farms would not have survived. And most certainly, I wouldn't be standing here speaking to you tonight. There are so many stories behind the stories that I just shared with you. And quite frankly, most of the changes in the business did not come easily for me. And I have to admit that I was just not a happy person for many years. Because most of the time, I was kicking and screaming, if not crying, about the changes. Karen really saved the farm with the innovations and changes that she made with the retail aspect of the farm. And with that said, I'm going to pass the mic to the brains of the operation. <laughs> My wife of 37 and a half years and counting, Karen. I'm Karen, the wife of 37 years. <laughs> um, I, I did have to work very hard during those tough years. I, I do admit that I was critical, critically important in helping with some of the changes that we had to make. But I have to say to you, um, I did not always feel uh, committed to this business. And I tried for many years to get him out of it. <laughs> so we had uh, many struggles in those early years. Um, I'm going to 
back up a little bit and explain to you how I met Fred and how this whole thing began. Um, I am from Boston. I am a city girl. I grew up in the city, on the streets, taking buses and trains to schools and so forth. And I um, became a registered nurse. I graduated from Boston College. And I practiced at Massachusetts General Hospital and a few other hospitals in the city, doing largely oncology, other medical stuff too. But um, I went back to school. We met at BU where uh, he was getting his master's. I went back to also get my master's in healthcare management. And we had many classes that overlapped. And as you just heard, his dad became sick. And so uh, he sort of uh, you know, came to me for a little bit of advice, medical information, anything I could offer. And um, when his father passed away, I, he asked me to go with him to the farm. If I would like to join him, go to Long Island, go down to Florida, and so forth. And um, in his very understated way, that was all he said. And I didn't ask any more than that. I said, OK, you know, this could be a little adventure. This could be temporary. Um, I gave up, um, sorry, that was probably, is that better? I gave up a position, actually, as a director of nursing uh, that was offered to me to go on this adventure. So I went to uh, Long Island briefly, and then we went to Florida from there. and like I had no clue what I had signed up for. It was really scary. Um, first of all, I went with him, but I never saw him because of the work, 15 hours a day or whatever. Um, there were no street lights. There were no sidewalks. There were no people or cars or traffic. There was like a whole world that I didn't know existed, you know? And the whole world of growing food was something I didn't know anything about. Um, and to this day, I just can't get over what it takes to grow food. You know, I really am in awe of those who grow the food. I'm, I'm not really the grower. I mean, my son and Lucy and, and Fred are. But um, I discovered that growing food was a lot of work. And everyone should really know about this. That's how I felt. Anyway, um, there were also there was also a very Asian culture on the farm that was very different from the Fred I knew. <laughs> In Boston, he was very cosmopolitan, but on the farm, he was a Chinese farmer. And uh, there were no women. <laughs> there were no women there either. There was Fred's mother and maybe Fong, and uh, one other person, and me, who wasn't even Chinese. So it was a little bit of a rough ride. So I did uh, hang in there. I did many times try to find other forms of employment that might be more lucrative, <laughs> less work, something different. It wasn't happening. You know, I didn't grow up with you know this in my family genes and in my, um, in my background, and to know what it felt like to have to, you know, make something successful, especially if his father had passed away, was something I didn't really understand uh, as deeply as I needed to. And so over, over time, I began to realize that he was not going to leave the farm. Uh, and I had to accept it, and eventually I did embrace it, particularly when the times got rough, because it started off rough and it got rougher. Um, as the wholesale market changed, um, we were, were dealing and struggling with uh, a niche that was shrinking and revenues that were disappearing. And um, I love flowers, so we grew flowers. <laughs> I had no master plan. And I had um, visited another farm that showed me the ropes a little bit, try to learn something about how I could help Fred with uh, a change here. And so I started the cut flowers, and I hired my three children. 
Um, <laughs> it was very, very fancy. Uh, William was maybe 10 or 11. Uh, my younger son was seven or eight, and Jennifer was 12-ish. And they were my flower cutters, and it was serious business. I went out and got accounts, other farm stands and so forth. They had to have their flowers ready by 9 a.m. So we were in the fields by 7. Uh, I'm a Boston girl. I grew up in the city. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, I had those kids up and out and in the fields by 7 o'clock every day. I do not know how I did it. Do you? <laughs> uh, it was pretty hard. Anyway, um, but they did it, and they got good at it. And 9 o'clock, those buckets were set up, and they were ready for the wholesalers to pick up. I fed them breakfast, and then we went back out. And then we cut for our table. So um, by noontime, they were pretty well, you know, done in. Um, but we did that for a couple of years. The first year, it was my three children. And the second year, they could each bring a friend. I had six children. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty interesting. Um, they each had their special flowers. They, as I said, got good at it. But I really did have to do a lot of whipping. <laughs> anyway, um, the interesting thing about the flower stand was on the road. And we were on a main road. We are still on the same you know, location, same main road, Route 48. And there are a lot of city customers that come out from New York City and drive past. And they stop to buy our flowers. There was one other crop that Fred decided to grow, and that was mescaloon. At that time, it was called mescaloon, not baby greens as it is now. And we'd only been growing it for maybe a year, and we sold it to the restaurants in the city and one other specialty food store called Balducci's. And I, believe it or not, I had customers stop and ask me when they stopped for the flowers, was I the same farm that sold the mescaloon to Balducci's? Because the Balducci family put our little name on their silver bowl way ahead of the time that really farms were advertised for their product. And they stopped for the flowers, and they wanted me to get them some mescaloon. So I was running around. I'm like, you know. Fred was very upset with this. I would open up the little crates that were getting shipped out, and I would take what I wanted of bok choy, baby bok choy, baby greens. Things were missing all the time, he tells me. But I had a larger vision, which was servicing these people. And I thought, all right, well, maybe I'll put out three things on the flower table. You know, we've got big bok choy, baby bok choy, baby greens, and flowers. That is how it began. There was no master plan, and we started a farm stand. Um, from there, I begged him, begged, that's a good word, because it was begging, to grow more things. And he did, under great duress, and he grew it organically. Each product that we added, he grew it organically, and we began to expand our line, starting that very first winter in the greenhouse, because I wasn't closing. I was going to keep that going, give these customers what they were looking for every single day. Like, I would run out to the cars. I would run around gathering what they needed. I was like a maniac. But that following spring, we really got put on the map a little bit. Uh, with an interesting visitor. And I'm hoping that this can come up on the internet for you. If you watch this little clip, you'll know what I'm talking about. Hey, Martha. Hi. I just spoke to your husband in the cooler. <laughs> we were loading nice in the to truck. Meet you. Nice and to meet um, you. I understand that you make something very special here, which we call a good thing. This is called the salad bowl for the person who doesn't have a garden and they want to be able to cut fresh lettuces. And what I'm trying to do is sort of alternate color as well as texture. And I use about 12 different plugs that will then 
fill in. And, and you sell these right, oh, can I show one that's yes. a little bit more grown? Let's show you a full one. And you yeah. sell these right here at we, the farm stand? We sell them on the stand. They make a wonderful gift item. Oh, they're wonderful. That Wouldn't one is you love is to ready? receive one of these at the beginning of a weekend? By the end of the weekend, you could have just sort of cut it all down and wait for the next weekend for it to rejuvenate. Exactly. You have to leave a little piece, but yeah, it will come That's beautiful. Back. Now, your daughter Jennifer handed me this, an assortment of the vegetable samples that you yes. offer your customers here at the stand. So you put these out because there's so many people who are not still familiar with yes. all these unusual vegetables. Exactly. I want people to taste what we have as well as see what we have and then offer them recipes and how to use them what as well. That's a good idea. And I Thank understand you. that Michael, your youngest, mm -hmm. is the flower arranger. Yes, he really loves When did the he flowers. get into the flowers? Well, we started the stand with a flower table. That's how we grew, and many people asked us, you know, for the bok choy and different things, and we eventually became a vegetable table as well. But he started with a flower table, and that was how we grew to this. I made this bunch out, and I call it a country bunch, because it's just kind of plain, doesn't have much color. Well, thanks so much, and I must get some things to take back to the studio so that I can cook with Great. your wonderful vegetables. Good. I'm okay. glad. Good. Enjoy them. Oh, and there's Dave. Uh -oh, Dave Paul is taking yep. me on this wonderful tour, so I'm very happy you brought me here, and I'll stop by every time come again. I come. We'd love to have Martha. you. Thank thanks you. a lot. Bye, Martha. Bye. Thanks for coming. You can see what I mean about children cutting flowers. That was, that was it right there. Um, and Martha arrived, we'd been open, what, one month. <laughs> you know, it was like unbelievable. So what was interesting, obviously, uh, she, we got a lot of phone calls, a lot of visitors from all over. It really kind of boosted our, uh, our startup. But um, her staff was pretty amazing, and, and as was she, actually. She knew a lot about vegetables. I was very impressed. And people loved what we were growing, her staff. So when they finished this video of us, they asked me if they could get my vegetables. Like, how could they get my vegetables? And I said, I'll send them to you. I had no clue how, but I was going to figure it out. How could I turn them down, right? Sending Martha and her sister and her staff uh, our pea shoots and our baby bok choy and our mescaloon and so forth. So I began to trial how I could mail order produce. And I really did send it to them for a number of years. They just kept buying and ordering, and it was really what I called my mescaloon by mail program. Um, <laughs> Which, you know, that was back in the day when people weren't, you know, having food delivered to their door like they are now. So, obviously, I have kept our mail order program going. We call it home delivery now. It's obviously different, and we are continuing to explore that avenue and also, you know, find new ways to do it and make it, you know, more... Um, relevant to the, the way things are done now, but that was how it began with Martha's crew. Um, the other thing that began in that ver very early part, that very first winter actually, was when customers asked me, uh, what dressing would you recommend that I put on these mescaline greens? Um, there really wasn't anything in the supermarket uh, worth telling them about. I mean, there was a very limited, maybe three different dressings, all pretty gross. <laughs> and so I would give out little recipe cards or I'd explain to people how to make dressings, you know. And maybe a few did, but most people gave me a very glazed look, like they were not going to do it. And I said to Fred, I can't have people putting junk on this beautiful salad. I have to make my own and, and sell it to them. So that very first winter, I, I played around with recipes. After all, I'm a nurse in the kitchen, right? <laughs> um, I developed recipes for five dressings, and they are still on my shelf today. Uh, and that was the beginning of sort of uh, a routine that I developed, a sort of rhythm of um, every winter working with recipe testing and uh, in an area that I felt was, you know, important. 
and then uh, introducing that the following season. I started with the dressing, as I said, for the salad greens. I also started with pestos, because that made sense with the herbs that we grew. And we also have a very famous ginger scallion dip uh, that was sort of something that would complement the uh, carrots and other you know, crudite that people had would be able to purchase. So we continue to do a lot of um, work in our kitchen, and we are certified organic by NOFA in our kitchen. Um, we have a whole addendum from them now of products that we make. Um, I had no idea, again, with this, when I started it, I just began where I knew I had to begin. We have uh, not only the dressings, dips, and pestos, I do a whole line of soups, I do a whole line of fermented, I do jellies, I do sauces, I can our tomatoes, I do some pickled, and we do a lot of fresh salads, you know, the ready-to-eat kind of things that people want. And I always keep in mind, just like those first customers that I had where I was running around getting bags of salad or baby bok choy for them. I, I listen to them and I want to know what their needs are and how I can, you know, help them. And today's uh, parents and today's, you know, society, uh, they need convenient but healthy food. So I try to provide that. So that's why our kitchen has continued to develop a convenient, more uh, side dishes for people, or cut up carrots, or soups, anything that can give people healthy food, certified organic food, in a more convenient manner. Um, I feel that going direct to the consumer, the whole retail model that Chris had mentioned we wanted to shift to, it took us 10 years to make the shift from wholesale to full retail. The day we dropped the wholesale, we were scared to death. And it took us 10 years to make that. Uh, we didn't take a day off. We worked 24-7, 365 days a year until that happened. And the entire time, I was completely focused, completely passionate about servicing my customers. I. There is nothing that can replace the quality of the product that you're providing and the quality of the service that you give it with. And it doesn't, there's no fancy formula for this. It just is that. So you take that wherever you are and you will be successful. I feel also that my role as a nurse, I mean, I am a nurse, always a nurse, always a mother, you know. Um, that the work that I do, particularly now that we are certified organic, I am so committed to that process and to the health and well-being that this food can provide for people. I am so passionate when I talk to my customers about the importance of eating this way, and I want to do everything I can to find ways to get it into their hands and make it easy for them to eat this way themselves and their families, from making it more convenient, providing home delivery, um, doing classes. Lucy does incredible newsletters with her CSA that are full of recipes and tips, et cetera. Anything that helps people um, maintain a healthy lifestyle or become more vibrant in their health. And I feel that my nursing is far better served in living this model than anything I could have done in the hospital setting. Awesome. So one final little story about our retail outlets, and that would be the farmer's markets. Um, they didn't exist when we first began, and a woman approached me to start one. Fred, of course, was nay, nay, nay. <laughs> too much, too hard, and I said, load up my van, I'm going. And I went with the family van. I had no table, no umbrella, no nothing. 
I sold it out of my van. I'd be like rummaging, trying to find things, sell it to people to get it into their hands. And that was the West Hampton Beach market. There was me and Elsie, you know. Um, it is now um, a very large and vibrant farmer's market. William and Lucy run it together with uh, a whole staff of people. And Chris obviously uh, is there as well, and it's an amazing place. It's hard to believe I started that way, right? Um, out of the back of my family Voyager van. <laughs> so on that note, I'll pass the, uh, the mic to William, my son. Thank you. Thank you for the honor. And uh, thank you, Chris, for the nomination. And thank you, Phil, and all the board members. Um, when she says she whipped us, it wasn't literally, but almost pretty close. <laughs> we used to uh, strip the mugwort uh, stems and pretend to whip each other like we were uh, driving you know, horses. Um, so I'd like to say first and foremost that I love the farm and uh, the lifestyle, um, the wonders of Mother Nature, and I'm sure you guys all feel the same way. Um, it's a blessing to work with my family and the amazing staff and my dog um, to produce organic veggies. <clears throat> um, I'm sure you guys have all had days like we've had on the farm uh, the days that are too wet to do anything, um, the days that are dry as a bone, um, the days where you can't sell anything at the market, and the days when you sell out. Um, I feel like being um, Farm of the Year, we have a responsibility um, to continue to be innovative, um, to drive the industry forward to the next step. Um, so here are some key points um, that we'd like to share with you. Um, these are things that work for us that we're continuing to improve on. Um, this is the West Hampton Beach Farmers Market, and this is a walkthrough that I designed uh, based off of a uh, farmers market in Hawaii, um, and the customers can walk through and shop in the shade. Um, and when the line develops, they're able to still pick out produce as they wait. So the people who are online aren't blocking the view of what you have available for the next person. So um, when it gets really rolling, um, sometimes there can be 25 people online, which is pretty amazing. And they're moving slowly past their options, which allows them to buy more. Uh, we also set up a uh, sampling booth right before checkout, um, which was one of the most innovative things we've done. I, I think it boosts sales uh, more than you can count. Um, the tomatoes, when they're sampled with a little salt or watermelon in the middle of summer, um, it really just sells itself. Um, and giving people a, a sample of it um, is something that most people won't turn down, and it really um, helps make that sale. Here's some of the staff. Uh, we, I can't really say enough good things about the staff we have. Um, some of them are people we've played on athletic teams with. Um, some people have just found us by chance. I sometimes feel like we just keep doing good work for the world, and good people come to us. Um, we sell everything that we can at the market, and I'm proud to say that we produce it all ourselves. Um, that's something that, you know, can't be said for all, but we, we feel really strongly about selling just what we grow and um, trying to do the best that we can to produce just what we sell. Uh, one of the first things that I was passionate about growing was watermelon, and when I was about 10, during that flower cutting time period, um, my father said to me, if you take care of the watermelons, you can bring them up to the side of the road and sell them. Um, and so 
that's what I did. I flagged the ones that were ready. I weeded and watered them. And I pushed them up in a push cart every morning. <laughs> and I, I sold them on the side of the road. Um, and you know, being 10, 11, 12, it was a pretty good gig. <laughs> and um, that was during the early stages of our retail development. And um, now we have a seven day a week farm stand. So um, I can't really say enough good things about straw mulch, um, weed control, uh, beneficial habitat, organic matter. It's been one of the best things for some of our vine crops and um, some of our crops that once you stake or string, you can't get in there to cultivate. So uh, we've taken on additional acreage. Um, We've managed more cover crops than I probably <laughs> could afford to or had time to. Um, but because of that, we're able to grow our own mulching straw. And um, I, I honestly think that it improves fruit quality um, to the point where it's very worthwhile. Um, <laughs> watermelon's probably my favorite crop. So as you can see, we're having a pretty good time with it in the middle of summer. Um, you need something to help you get through those August days. Some sales. Um, and so I'd like to thank the, um, all of the people that grow this food and all the seed companies and everybody who's helping drive this industry forward because um, without all the growers and without the producers and the people who are saving the seeds and doing all that work, we wouldn't be able to have such a great product to sell. So thank you again. Um, Asparagus is another great crop for us. We've continued to do really well with it, and um, the production and yield has gone up because of the organic practices. I really feel that without the use of herbicide, um, by using some of the mulching techniques, some of the projects I've done with NRCS and the drip irrigation <laughs> and uh, soil and water, um, we've been able to conserve resources, uh, lower our nutrient management, and also um, increase yields. So I encourage all you guys to focus on those objectives, um, especially with your perennial plantings. So um, grass roadways, um, leaf mulch, straw mulch, anything like that. Um, bok choy has always been a staple for our farm. And um, one of the main reasons why we're able to grow organically on the scale that we grow is because of the uh, equipment and mainly the transplanter. Uh, this is a transplanter that I designed um, with Chechi Magli, and uh, it has a, a water um, tank on it that we put a little bit of liquid um, Omri approved fertilizer in, and uh, it's uh, three mini triums. And uh, I asked specifically to have a shade cover put on it and um, plant spacing. Um, the two-week jump we can get on weeds um, and the cultivation that we can do afterwards and then the spacing for harvest and, and things have been amazing. Um, this is bed making production. Um, that's a fertilizing bed shaper with a hydraulic uh, bed forming press. Uh, that's the cedar. I still use this little Chang cedar uh, for carrots and things and then the um, basket weeder. So uh, that cultivator has been um, really uh, influential on cutting down labor costs for certain crops that I can space accordingly. Um, regardless, we still have to do a lot of hand labor, which I'm sure you guys all know <laughs> uh, plenty about. Um, but straw mulching, um, winter storage carrots, they've, they've really been uh, great for us. We can bring them into the kitchen and do a lot of value-added things. There's our human resources director, Molly. Um, she'll tell us instantaneously if there's a good candidate or not. And um, just some more shots of carrots. One of our favorite crops. Um, water wheel transplanter, tomatoes, some of the innovative techniques we've done um, not only with uh, cultivation is work on uh, spacing for plants, um, stake spacing, types of stakes, size of the stakes, um, 
plastic mulch in between the rows or cover crop between the rows. We've even done burlap between the rows, straw <laughs> mulch between the rows, um, anything to keep the weeds down because it's such a long-term crop. Um, I love straw mulch. Lucy likes the plastic. We're in a hot debate, so this <laughs> season we will be trialing again. So um, I urge you guys to continue trials and um, different varieties or whatever it is to continue diversifying your techniques and just keep trying new things. Um, some of the cover cropping and um, organic matter that we've added in has really helped us uh, get to the quality we want at the end. Um, I can't really say uh, enough good things about sorghum and uh, the weed suppression, um, buckwheat for garlic preparation, um, the rye and the barley for um, different types of mulch. Um, Earlier there was field peas and, and crimson clover, which is great for the insects, beneficials. I'm sure you guys all use these techniques, but I, I encourage you to continue. Um, one thing we, we started this year was um, uh, native pollinators, which has been great in the orchard. Um, greenhouse cucumbers, um, a great early crop. So before we have things coming out of the field to sell, um, the first thing is usually zucchini, cukes, um, and then coming back from doing a little growing in Hawaii, um, ginger and turmeric has become a real great tropical crop for us. Um, it takes a long time, so you got to start it early, but um, during those off times when the hoop houses are almost too hot to grow anything else, um, those plants actually perform really well, so it's a great kind of midsummer filler. Lots of um, high tunnel usage. The high tunnels that we've moved from farm to farm that we have now on our home property um, have really helped us get through the early and late part of the season. So I would track down any grant funding you can get for high tunnels or specialized equipment. And um, there's just some lifestyle photos. Uh, so in closing, um, I urge you guys to continue to create innovative approaches and uh, try new techniques for the future of organic food production. Um, thank you for the award. Keep hammering. <laughs>
Um, and everyone loves bok choy when they try it raw. Just you guys all know that. But we've uh, realized that over the years, sampling it. Um, these are just some other tours we've done. Um, and that brings us to the CSA. Um, so about three years ago, um, maybe four, uh, one of the main farm um, managers, he was sick. And um, you know it sort of became evident that I was going to have to take on the CSA and figure it out because he wasn't there to teach me what he'd done. So um, like Karen, you know, I said, OK, I'll, I'm on board. I've figured it out. But um, the farm, you know, Sangley has been um, doing the CSA since 2006 before I was there. And um, we had just 32 members to start with in uh, the farm community. And then it expanded to um, Dumbo in 2000, um, 2008, Crown Heights in 2009 in Brooklyn Bridge in 2010, all in Brooklyn. And uh, now we have several hundred members. We have several sites on Long Island and community centers. Um, we have a pickup at the farm at all our markets. So it's really grown. Um, this is me with some of the different coordinators at the different sites. That's um, one of the coordinators with Fred and Karen when they first started. Um, so yeah, the CSA um, really has become the most, the highlight of my work. Um, because I'm all about what it stands for, which is community. Um, and not just for our small North Fork community, but it allows us to provide affordable, clean, safe food um, to a diverse array of neighborhoods in Brooklyn, Long Island, Queens, um, visiting the sites, meeting the members. And um, you know, at our open house we have every year and at the drop sites, it really validates what we do, seeing how appreciative people are that don't have access, really, to fresh food. Um, so that has been something that I love that we can provide and why I think the CSA program is so important in the scope of our, w the work that we do. Um, so yeah, these are just some other pictures of the different communities. Um, and yeah, <laughs> thank you guys. I'll pass it back to Fred to wrap up. Four minutes I think I have this down to. Um, thank you for your patience and thank you Karen, Will, and Lucy for sharing all the photos that you put together. Um, as you know, all the changes that we experience over time, and before I forget, is Fran Miller in the audience? Can you raise your hand? Um, one of our core team members in the Crown Heights um, CSA was so helpful in helping that CSA get off the ground and started at one time we had over 200 members, and thank you again for all your help. <laughs> Do we have any CSA members here in this room from any of the communities? Yep, thank you for all your support. And we have one other staff member, I think, here. Asa, are you here? Just raise your hand. Thank you for your help this past season. Raising a family, being a farmer, and staying sort of happily married for 37 years, <laughs> it really seemed like an impossibility to me. But I'm here to tell you today that it isn't. Someone once told me a farmer joke, and it went something like this. Two farmers were checking the signal lights on their farm truck. First one told the second one, go down in front, tell me if it's working. I don't know if you know this joke. So after a while, a second farmer is looking at the signal light, and he's kind of scratching his head, looking at it. And the first farmer, he's, you know, he's getting impatient. He says, I'm turning on the signal light. I want you to tell me if it's working. The second one thought for a little while. He said, well, it's working now, but now it isn't. Now it is, but now it isn't, <laughs> if you can picture that. Um, what does this all mean? The point of the story is that most people's perception of running a farm really entails simple-minded folks just putting seeds in the ground and watching the fruits and profits grow in a short period of time. And everyone in this room knows nothing could be further from the truth. Today's organic farm operations on any scale, whether it be a quarter acre or more than 100 acres, involve a great deal of planning, record keeping, labor issues, FISMA regulations, weather, and just a lot of hard work. Farming is a business and a skilled craft. Clearly being a farmer of any sort, no less an organic farmer on any scale, is not the easiest thing to do in the world. 
If it were so, everyone and their grandmothers would be doing it. In a nation of over 330 million people, the percentage of the population directly involved in agriculture is, does anyone know? 2.7. I believe it's between one and 2%. An old farmer neighbor of mine, every time I saw him and I asked him, how are you today? He would respond to me, another day older and deeper in debt. A wholesale distributor that I worked for, worked with for many years, uh, posed a question to me after a particularly challenging season. He asked me, what's the difference between a newborn baby and a grower farmer? Does anyone know the answer? I said, I don't know. He said, well, a newborn baby stops crying every now and then. <laughs> This point was not lost on me, if you think about it. The message that I want to leave you with tonight <laughs> is something that I heard before, and that's if you let your intentions become your thoughts and allow your thoughts to become your actions, your actions can move you toward your goal and achievement. Change is always certain. Outcomes are not, and efforts from outcomes or not. Farming organically and producing healthy, nourishing foods is a most noble occupation and also a great task. While it might not return you the best financially, it will provide you with a good life. You will no doubt encounter many setbacks and disappointments, but remember the great things do not come easily by themselves. All of you are changing the world we live in today by being here today at this conference and farming organically. With a bit of good weather and a lot of hard work and some faith, you can accomplish all that you set your hearts on doing. A mantra that I live by was said by Mahatma Gandhi, we need to be the change we wish to see in the world. In closing, I wish all of you much success and God's blessings in your lives and farming endeavors. Thank you again for all the help and support, the NOFA New York board members and fellow farmers for this honor and recognition from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you.